it might be best to uh, mute ourselves until uh, you want to talk. And um, I, we were going to suggest that the, the folks, uh, is there anybody there? Uh, Susan Williams, your group, if um, somebody wants to comment, uh, last week it was kind of hard to hear you. So if you would move up closer to the microphone or the, the computer, or whatever, um, and we'll watch for you moving and then we'll make room for you. We'll, the, the water will split, uh, open up. You can cross yeah. over and make your statement. How's that? Oh my goodness, what happened? Yeah. Oh, there. <laughs> I have to get out and get back in. She's closer now, or while well, she was, when we could see her. Uh, I can see her right now. I have to get out and get back in. Why? Huh? We're not showing it. We're black. Yep, they're gone. All right. Well, we'll we will proceed and uh, expect them to return. We're on chapters seven and eight. Yep. Chapter seven, leave no one behind. And the question I'm told to love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? And uh, the quote from Martin Huber, love is the responsibility of an I for a you. And this consists what cannot consist in any feeling, the equality of all lovers. That um, opening uh, the, the witness of the woman who had been in um, concentration camps in uh, World War II and her story and his reaction seeing the tattoo on her arm. Um, it's like it flipped a switch for him and he admitted that he was sort of distracted and uh, Maybe not his listening with his head, but it wasn't coming, it wasn't touching uh, where it did when he saw that tattoo and realized that she was an it to the Nazis who had sent her to the camp. And um, my, the question that came to me is, uh, that still happens. We st still do that, how does, how does that come about? How does somebody who we know as a human being, how do they become an it to us? By being a lot different than we are. Okay. We see them as I thought. Okay, right. Gloria, why don't you go ahead and then Carolyn. We see them as a, 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 a a part of a, a blob, like, like the people who, for me, the people who stormed the Capitol. Yeah. I see them not as individuals, but as a, you know, a amorphous group. A mob in that yeah. case. Yes. Yeah. Carolyn, what were you gonna say? Well, I thought his story, and he saw this woman, she was telling her story, he just kind of was listening, you know, but he saw a rich Jewish woman with all the jewelry on, and she was an it then, until he saw the tattoo, and all of a sudden, he saw the backstory, you know, the story behind all of this, and then she became a real person to him. But I think even within that one story, it moved from one to the other. That good was point. just my observation anyway. I think that's a good, uh, a good observation. Maybe a follow-up um, as we, maybe having read this, we become more aware of our own reaction when we're, the, the language that I've come across is when we are othering, um, they are other than I am, they are other than we are, they're different somehow. And so othering becomes a verb. It's a way of distancing, classifying, and really dehumanizing or um, 
turning them into an it. And if we become aware of that, how can we sort of catch ourselves when we're doing that? Uh, and maybe there's no answer that uh, to give to that, but is that possible? And is that something that um, <laughs> we're willing to work on? I don't. Uh, I I don't think I've had anything with the connection to people, but it's like there are groups of people out there, and I just. You know, they're out there, and I'm not thinking about them. They could be good people, bad people, and different. But when it comes to the ones that are hurting, they're just part of the people out there. It's when you get face to face contact and you get to know somebody, and you're real, just like everybody else. Um, yeah. You just, you know, had bad luck or bad decision or whatever. And they're so the other kind of just evaporates, it goes away. Uh, and it's not a necessarily a, a eureka moment, uh, yeah, like it was for Pastor Curry. Um, anyhow, I, being aware of, I mean, I'm aware of there's people out there, but it's it's only when it's for face to face to really get aware. Yeah. Do you find yourself ever um, uh, imposing sort of motives on those people? Um, they, they did this um, and there must have been something dark or nefarious about them that caused them to do that. And so well, then it's maybe justifiable. For example, I can do that real easy. <laughs> I, but, you know, for the homeless people, I don't really think they did anything wrong deliberately. Um, I think it just kind of happened. Plus, being born at a disadvantage. What, I don't think we recognize we're all born for the most part with advantages. And so we don't realize other people don't have that. Yeah. Um, Jeff? Yes, Caroline. I had, I had that experience. Can't get this back on. Dang it. Can you, can no, you, you you're hard to hear. I wish I could help. Yes. Well, you just have to speak louder. Okay. I had that and hear them. I had that experience in a quilting class, seeing the numbers on somebody's arm, and uh, uh, I was talking away. And this lady that had been in class for a couple of weeks uh, decided to take off her sweater because she was warm in the quilting class, and I was there ready to help her do whatever it was she was having a problem with and there were these numbers on her arm and it kind of caught me by surprise and I tried not to gasp <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, she was very comfortable with it uh, didn't say anything I didn't say anything I wondered if I should have and we were fine <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, my mother always told my brother and I to try not to react when you saw something unusual in another person. And I think she did a good job of that because that came back to me that don't react, just <laughs> act normally and everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah. But I've I've never forgotten it. No, I'm sure not. Yeah. I got it. 
<laughs> was anyone else um, particularly struck by the the um, uh, as he talked about um, Martin Buber and that I thou um, uh, understanding or perspective that that if the that other person is a thou rather than an it, um, then the relationship uh, shifts with that. Whenever anybody uses someone, that person is an it, you know, whether it's, you know, parent, child, or in a relationship at all. And, you know, we talk about the not doing it, but we have that within us to, um, you know, as a human being, and, and it's frightening to think about it, but it's there. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not a distant thing, it's here. <laughs> and that's my point anyway. So no. if we talk about I, I, thou, you know, in all relationships, we need to be looking at whether we're, we talked about this morning when we talked about the children's sermon is, you know, um, that we need to think about what we say, well, whether it will hurt another person or not. And that's just that whole thing about, you know, thinking about a relationship and whether what we say and do is hurtful to someone else. Yeah, yeah. Bishop Curry says, everybody is God's somebody, and yeah. we need to remember that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so true. Isn't it? Um, I, I was struck by, um, because I've had these conversations different places with different people, on page 144, um, I mean, there's several things here, but the where we, uh, the last full paragraph in the page, um, <clears throat> stop, look, listen, learn. The key is to pause deliberately to give yourself time to notice. The Buddhist tradition speaks of the importance of mindfulness. Psalm 46 says it is says it this way: "Be still and know that I am God." The wisdom of the Sabbath is that it provides the opportunity to stop, pause, and notice the presence of God in the world, God in the other, God in ourselves just um, Sabbath as that pause with mm -hmm. that intention. Um, I don't know that I heard it said that way, or if I had, it hadn't registered with me. I mean, I get the whole thing about pausing and relationships and all that, but um, that it is the intent of Sabbath is for that pause, that stepping back from everything in order to look around and sort of recalibrate. <clears throat> I thought that that struck me when I read that. And I was thinking how, do you remember years ago when on the Sabbath, there were no stores open, there were yeah. you know nothing like that. And now it's just you know hustle and bustle like any other day. So I, yeah, that's... I paused when I read that because I thought, okay, that's a, I got to think about that some more. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and, and so the, the Sabbath is no longer an imposed thing. Right. Um, now it has to be uh, an organic thing that comes from within that I realize I need to do this. Otherwise, I go off the rails and relationships suffer and, um, uh, I can become a jerk pretty easily. And, and so if I don't take that, that intentional pause to wait a minute, uh, you know, to reflect as well, where am I here? Um, it can become a pretty uh, mindless, soulless uh, way of living. And well, uh, leave it to you whether that sort of describes <clears throat> our our larger society these days uh, 
I don't know. On page 145, this was something that um, we talked about at staff this morning. Um, that last paragraph and the last uh, two lines of the paragraph. The church is the only society that doesn't exist for the good of its members. That kind of hit me right between the eyes. Mm -hmm. Really? You know, for me too, that's what I highlighted that because I thought that that uh, really says what we should be. And he, you know, when he goes on, he talks about how, how that happens or doesn't happen. And uh, it's easy, I think, for a church to go in the way of, you know, being for, for us. And I yeah. thought of situations <laughs> in which I felt like, well, we shouldn't, I, but specifically the AA group, there are so many women there. And I thought, uh, well, you know, they, they should be able to pay us something more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes. And all of those in the back of our minds, those, those things where we, we kind of, I guess this was articulated so bluntly and so clearly that I think that's where the impact comes from. Um, I've heard it said in other ways, you know, uh, softer, gentler ways that it's easier to get, a, get, a, get around. But this one just really stops me. And um, I think it's sort of a, a, a constant challenge to us. Right, and we did a bit at staff meeting this morning and, and you know, Jeff said it shouldn't be or, or but both and, that we should find ways to, if we're not nerd at a church, we <coughs> just like in a relationship, you don't have anything to give, but being nurtured and coming together and talking about uh, how we give, that we give. So it's um, not just a one-way street. <coughs> Who are the it's in our part of the world? I think one large group of its would be uh, people who are incarcerated. Mm. They're, once they enter those doors, even after they leave those doors, they're still its to a lot of society. Oh yeah. And, and they've done bad things. And so they got themselves into that fix. I mean, we, that, you know, that's in, in, uh, are thinking my thinking sometimes that we well, didn't have to do that you know you didn't have to decisions that are made but uh yes i it's so true i mentioned um the guy that had come and we'd uh given some assistance to and then he'd returned and wanted more and was really jerky about it. Well, he he became an it for me pretty quickly. My interaction with him on that Sunday was really positive and, oh uh, yeah, we're good. And then, mm. so <laughs> he jumped, I pushed. Uh, I don't know <laughs> what the dynamic is, but he ended up over there for me. And um, I'm, I'm still struggling with that. But, you know, that's just one example of, of how it can happen. Mm -hmm. And well, pe people at the border. Oh, yeah. yeah. It for a lot of us, I think, for a lot of people. Do you remember when the 
uh, there was just this, and now we're, we're doing it again, but it was during Obama's time, that influx of, of um, unaccompanied uh, mm -hmm. children. Yep. And, and people carrying signs that they're not our children. Mm -hmm. They're not our children. They're and, it's. Oh, I just, I don't, um, uh, going back to your example, it seems yeah. to me that we have to separate somewhat how we sort of view somebody as a person, whether they deserve to be loved as a person from their behavior. The fact that he's a jerk doesn't mean you have to, I mean, you don't have to treat him like, you, know, you don't have to be a doormat, but, you know, if he's a jerk, he's a jerk and you respond, but that doesn't mean you have to see him as someone who is an it or worthless. Yes, absolutely. And that's my struggle is I put them into a category pretty quickly, and then they have to somehow redeem themselves. And that's that's on me. Um, I realize that. I Maybe um, it's on him too though. It is, but I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't uh, fix his behavior. All I can do is, <laughs> wait a minute. I, he's still a thou, I guess is the point that, that he's still a human being. And even if he's a jerky human being right now, well, what's his backstory? Uh, I have no idea what that is, you know, so maybe there's, who knows? Um, might be best that you don't know. Yeah. yeah. You know, might be or, even more if you knew. If I took However, the Everybody's an it to somebody. Well, <laughs> and that's part of the problem though, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. And so, for us, as as good Christian church going folk or church, well, uh, what would church we're not people. church going now? We're church virtual attending now. Whatever that it's incumbent on us <clears throat> to do the work here, whether or not we get the response <laughs> from people. You know, I, so I treat you as a thou, and you still are a jerk. Okay, uh, that's. Uh... Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I, I'm sitting here getting all upset imagining this because I, I mean, personally feeling this. Uh, because you want to help people, but if they and demand men and won't take anything but yes, and when you say no, and, and if it causes the thing, at least I should be able to step back from it. But I always have this problem, I want everybody to be happy. And <laughs> it doesn't <No>. happen. <laughs> no. You've noticed that. I have too. <laughs> well, often the case. Maybe that goes to the notion that you have to maintain distance from some of these people. If you're going to think of them as a thou, you maybe have to have some separation because if you're having terribly negative interactions, it's, there's no way you're going to be thinking of them the same way. So I think that's why for some folks like that, you just have to maintain the distance. And if it if it repairs the relationship later, that's fine. But you 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 can't be in those both those places at the same time. Somebody's screaming in your face and demanding stuff. Nobody is going to think of them. Oh, this is really a nice guy. I ought to be treating him better. <laughs> well, he's a jerk, but he's God's jerk, and so right. I have to treat him. <laughs> okay, God, it's, not, not just jerk. <laughs> uh, well, is that's true? And um, monitor or, or uh, having the right distance and and keeping that uh, so that I. I can maintain my own sense of the thou thing. The, the, this is not an other, this is not an it, this is a human being and uh, whatever's going on here. Um, you, can, you can look at it as you gave him a good listening to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, that the second one, Janine got the, she got the, the venom. I, I just got it secondhand. So she was the one that was caught in it, which was really distressing. Um, 
And that, that's yeah. just another whole story, but um, it's an example of the th sort of thing that can happen anywhere uh, at any time. Road rage, um, uh, the neighbor who's, uh, you know, dog or whatever comes over and uses your yard, you know, all those things. Um, can help, but kind of wonder, uh, this all struck me that the church is the only institution that wasn't uh, set up for the people themselves. I don't know that that's always true, but that may be a, an objective. I do think an awful lot of church happened because I don't like what's going on, and so we're going to go here and start our own church that we like. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and maybe didn't do things outside of the church. I don't know. But yeah, it's very easy to get preoccupied uh, with keeping the church going, then there's less attention left for uh, more external things. Anyhow, I didn't know, I, I just wanted to, I wish you'd have clarified the sentence a little more. <laughs> you know, what I was he thinking with that? It, it's, a, it's a great objective. It's hard to have it needed all the time. Yeah, well, in I'm thinking, you know, a banner somewhere with that up that moved around in the building so that it caught our eyes occasionally as a reminder that, you know, uh, we have a unique um, mission and it's, um, it's for the good of the, the whole world. It's for the good of the neighbor. It's you know, if our God is, as he said, God is love, as the scripture says, God is love, well, then everything that we do, uh, that should should echo through there somehow. And um, if that's not happening, then uh, it's on us to sort of attend to that and um, find ways to, to correct, uh, address, um, renew. What things struck you as you, did you mark anything? I'm going through looking at places that I marked. Um, I've moved up to page 152. Is there anything but, uh, prior to that that you want to talk about? His stories were interesting about going from one church to another and how they were different. Everything. Yeah. But I, I didn't have much um, feeling for that other than enjoying his stories of how he related to all of that. It wasn't like, oh, you know, oh, there I've been, I know what it is to walk out and have to clean up all the needles off the ground before you have a meeting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, wow. I just like this one sentence on 151, or, and I just think it's, not much to say about it, but it seems through each step of the way, progress came because one person became committed yeah. and brought along others. Yeah. And in time, this became time. part of our life as a church. And I think that's so true. I think. Yeah. I had that so, mark. So that kind of suggests that um, the mission of the church, a particular church, can be shaped or expanded or shifted by one person's, you know, warmed heart or awakening, mm -hmm. or I see this now and I really need to do something about that. What can we do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you start a, a group that's 
this is going to be our ministry or this is going to be our project or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, it doesn't have to start with some grand vision. Yeah. And a charge conference to vote on it and approve it. You know, <laughs> And it might not, you might even not even know where it's going. It might just be exactly. an idea that someone takes off with it. I think yeah. that's a good point, Tony, that that um, you don't have to have the the end point goal mm -hmm. in life. Uh, let God kind of worry about that. Mm -hmm. I've often thought our meetings or the committees should be set up around what shows up that needs a need and then you form somebody that cares about that and goes and does it but you know just to have a committee for the sake of a committee it doesn't doesn't have much energy and it doesn't go anywhere so i like that idea um would we dare restructure and and structure around these are things we see in our world that need attention. So, um, you mean which ones change can we the method? Change it, the method of this? <laughs> How dare you? Even I know it. I know. Uh, uh -huh. How about that? Well, that's that's certainly part of our our tradition. That was how the whole Wesleyan Methodist movements began. We, they saw this need, these people who are hungry or these people who are not part of the church or these people who are in, in debtor's prison and uh, families that are destitute, we got to do something about that. Um, he, was talk he was talking about the street preachers too. Yes. And have, to mm -hmm. have somebody come and, and figure that out, you know. <laughs> How are we going to give a five minute sermon? But <laughs> I don't think it's possible. <laughs> Speak out of love and not out of judgment. And I think oh. I, I I really have done that before. <laughs> Judge somebody before I know. We all have, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I marked that page 152. That led to an idea. What could happen if we started to have street corner revivals? Yeah. The singing, preaching, well, and witness. Ugh. Is that would that even be allowed in Golden Valley? <laughs> I don't know. You We'd know, all go to I jail. You can see them <laughs> sending the cops and sticking you in the back seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just gave me the willies, just the thought of it. So there you go. You only have one corner in our village, and it would be in our property, and I don't want anybody out there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, even the idea of, you know, a service outside where anybody could wander in, I mean, you lose control potentially, yes. right? Um, that's scary. Well, obviously in this situation, he was, he probably felt the same way. I mean, it was like, how do we do this? I've never done this before. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's yeah. why he, he called in this other guy that- Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> done it and so, you need to tell yeah. us all yeah you know the idea got started yeah were you struck by the the um i mean when he talks about do singing going out in oh, the neighborhood yes. and singing of oh. that silent night no, spirit no. of hope could do that yes and yeah. that yeah. silent night and the guy responding yeah. in the alley oh the alley did that not just sort of break your heart? Yep. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I cry every time we sing that anyway, and now it's going to be worse because that's yeah. going to be in my head. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, good story. That last um, paragraph on page 154, it's far tougher to maintain a humble and dedicated relationship with God and with others, especially others who are not like you. Yep. That kind of relationship, the I, yeah. how, I, thou relationship is how we create a new dynamic where there are no saviors, but only people working together for a better future for the good of all. I marked that too, yeah. Yeah.
I think he had a lot of awakenings when he went to that new church. I think so too. <laughs> There's um, a lot like to- The party church, the one, you know, that they started out, they had nine groups doing, out doing each <laughs> parties. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, how do you turn that around? And they did, I mean, but I they just did. thought it was interesting, the process. Isn't it? Yeah. And it wasn't like, well, we're going to come in and we're going to change this, you know, rework the whole thing. Let's restructure. But a, a mission and a passionate mission has the power to, to change mm -hmm. and redirect energy. The story of the, the drug dealing guy. Mm -hmm. Starting page 155, the, the unexpected baptism. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> page 157, the more I came to know his background and to know him, the more I realized we weren't very different at all and it became harder and harder to dislike him. Eddie wasn't a drug dealer. He was a person, a child of God like me. I was now in a relationship with him and the result was love, whether or not I saw it coming or even wanted it. <laughs> and at first he didn't want it. No. I appreciate the honesty there. You know, and he yeah. says, this guy, he just stiffened when this guy showed up. He didn't even mm -hmm. want him in the building. Didn't want to talk to him. Didn't want to deal with him. Uh, makes me feel better. I, I understand those feelings really well. Tell me about Jesus. 157. And that guy said, tell mm -hmm. me about Jesus. How do you respond to that? How does that feel? Well, I thought that was actually good that he didn't immediately like jump into his good point Jesus, because that I think could probably be more of a turnoff. So the fact that he wasn't mm -hmm. like, pushing his religion on the guy but was kind of allowing it to come like yeah, naturally yeah um, I thought that was good even if he didn't do it on purpose yeah <laughs> <laughs> he, he backed into it uh, yeah right. but thank it seemed you like it was a better approach <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right all right <laughs> could I could I back up just a second here yeah you yeah. were you were saying you're talking about how he sort of bared himself yeah there. i think that's probably what would make him a wonderful bishop because uh, he's leading folks like you yep yep and uh not somebody who's quote unquote lording it over others but yeah. is on a pedestal yeah. And knows he still has a lot to learn. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say something mean. I'll just keep it to myself. What? <laughs> it, no, it was just a snide remark about bishops, and I don't think they can be that way. I don't think a real bishop can be that. That's <laughs> facetious, sarcastic. That's me. <laughs> um, there are some wonderful bishops but there are some that are very full of themselves. <laughs> and yeah. Mm -hmm. so Jeff, bishops are it for you? <laughs> <laughs> some have I was, been. I was going to ask you yes, what you think of I'll David confess. Bard. <laughs> <laughs> and for some of them, I have been it. It's maybe it. with a couple more letters. So I will just leave that at that too. <laughs> I, I at one point asked if um, I could, when I moved, if I could empty my file in the bishop's office and start over. And the district superintendent said, it's not that thick. <laughs> I think Bishop Corey would be interesting yes oh yes 
He just seems so caring and kind and. What do you bet he's um, got a lot of invitations to visit after mm -hmm. this book came out? Oh, a lot. Gloria can tell you something very recent about that. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know what he was leading to. I just got my hair done. And, yeah. and this hairdresser I'd never met before, we were, we were talking about going to church and things, you know, about Easter. She said, sunrise service, she'll miss. And, and I had this book along because I thought I just might have some time that I had to wait. And so as we we're leaving, she saw the book and she said, oh, he's just wonderful. <laughs> and and it was it was really fun to have a little discussion okay. about him. Cool. But he, he knew about she him because, him or, because of the, the royal wedding. And uh I I I didn't get enough background on this. I didn't really start right up at the beginning. I don't know if if it told anything about this at the beginning, but I, I didn't remember he was the one. Very little. Blew everyone away at the wedding. Yeah, yeah. I well, heard him speak. They use a... him back again. If you're interested, <laughs> um, the wedding uh, sermon is on uh, YouTube. You can go back oh. and watch just his preaching, just so you know. Oh. I may have to do that. I might do. I don't know how though. Yeah, I know me either. <laughs> <laughs> I just I'll went bet. in and Googled it. I mean, it, it'll it get you there. Just give it a shot. Okay. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Well, we'll see. I'll let you know if, I, if <laughs> okay. I'm anybody or if I'm it. If you disappear <laughs> into the internet, Judy, we'll come yeah. lurking for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Get caught in the web. Yes. I was thinking if somebody asked me to tell them about Jesus, if not, if if they didn't know anything at all, what oh, would I choose to say? You know, where would I begin? And. Huh. So it did make me kind of think about, you know, that what would I think would be an important thing to say if I had just a little bit of time or if I really wanted to make an impression, I, I, I would not talk about the resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would talk about how he asked us to say God was love and, and that he came to tell us about that. And, if you listen to the children's sermon on Sunday morning, you'll hear more about that. <laughs> Maybe, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see where that goes. We never know. Well, he said um, on page 158, uh, talking about Jesus, it was all completely new to him, and that made it new for me. Borrow from progressive theologian Marcus Borg, I met Jesus again for the first time from a person who was seeking salvation in a very real and immediate way. The, the baptism on the next page, deal, the deal. Yeah. that uh, I found very moving. Mm -hmm. um, middle of the page, 159. Uh, you are sealed by the yeah. Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Never before had I trembled or felt myself tearing up during baptism, but I did that day. Never before had I looked into eyes gazing at me with such intensity. You think he knew what, Bar what he was talking, what Bishop Curry was talking about, really? If you never heard of Jesus, could you understand this part? That's a good point. No, I don't think so. I think it it no. goes together. I was thinking, you know, from a standpoint, your standpoint as a pastor, um, it must be more moving in general to baptize adults than to baptize babies. Um, 
I don't know. I, it, I mean, it's more rare. So it's, uh, I don't know. Um, it certainly can be. I, that had one baptism in a lake. Um, we're doing an outdoor service and it was this teenage kid. It was his birthday and he wanted to be baptized. And um, I don't know if he was 16, maybe even. And um, I almost lost him because he's so tall and <laughs> he went down and I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't get him back up. And I didn't realize you're supposed to have them bend their knees when they go down. So you, you don't have quite so much to bring back up out of the water. Uh, so almost lost <laughs> you know, the one that almost got away. <laughs> but it was like baptism and funeral in one. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say, Chris. <laughs> You well, know? it is dying and rising, so I was hoping that yeah. if the first part happened, the second part would happen too, but, you know, sometimes that takes a while, but it was, it was moving, um, not, I mean, that part was kind of funny and a little bit uh, panicky, but his, uh, the intensity that he, uh, with which he wanted this, and that he spoke of a new birth on his birthday. It was really oh, very, that was nice. Very touching, yeah. And his his background was kind of um, have to wait to the hour. Right? His uh, mom, I think, the dad left them, and it was him and his mom, and it was kind of a had a kind of a rough um, upbringing. So you know that with that as backstory, it makes it that much more powerful. Yeah. I just remembered something. Uh, years ago, there was a kid in confirmation. It was in my daughter's confirmation class who had not been baptized. Mm. So he was baptized, uh, I think, the Friday evening before the Sunday confirmation. And the boys in the class carried him mm. up to, uh. it was so touching. It was just so wonderful to see them all participate yeah. in this baptism. That's neat and memorable for them, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, we're still on that first chapter seven. Um, <laughs> that uh, story about the, the fire in the church, whether it was mm -hmm. going to leave the city or not. Well, yeah, that was good. That was yeah. cool. The little boy sure was listening to his answer. He was. <laughs> his confirmation of homework. Yeah. <laughs> I have to redo it. in the bell choir. Yeah. Well, um, chapter eight, uh, we talked some about that this morning at staff, figuring that that would have some special meaning for, for this congregation. Yes. I shared with Jeff some of them uh, became a reconciling congregation and we had, um, you know, we went that process and uh, invited people in to tell their stories. And uh, I was telling Jerry that this morning that, I, that um, you know, we just sat there right because so many of said that they, uh, their parents didn't accept that coming out and they were out of their family and that they really felt uh, you know they felt like the church didn't want them and part of the whole reconciling thing was to, for the churches to state publicly we want you, you know and make that statement that's how we came about becoming reconciling i think bishop curry curry had quite a struggle Mm -hmm. Yes. 
And yet the Episcopal Church made those decisions sooner than we have. We're not there yet. Right. Right. I, I mean, I'm talking about kind of a personal one. Yes. Right. Mm. One of the quotes was, I could only do what I believed to be right as best I could discern it. Discern it. What page is that on, Judy? 182. Okay. Kind of the last sentence in the first chapter. Okay. <clears throat> uh, on page 172, after he was asked by this guy who would be a friend of his um, about um, sanctioning the uh, blessings of same-sex unions. That uh, second full paragraph, the fact was I had grown up in a church community that did not approve of homosexuality. The way they expressed that was in silence. There was no call against it in the pulpit, but there wasn't anyone telling us love is love either. And I, that's probably true for a lot of us that um, it was, uh, there was an awareness of it, but it was just uh, off over there. It wasn't our concern and certainly wasn't something that the church should do anything about or with. Uh, Even talk about. Right, mm -hmm. right. I'd, I'd have to say for myself, I, I, I grew up and it was like, not here. It was something sort of new maybe in New York. It would happen, but not here. Or I just, yeah. just didn't, didn't make any difference. I mean, it just never thought about it. So it wasn't until later in life even thought one way or the other. And it baffles me to this day why it's such a big issue. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's like, oh, I don't know. Um, there is a difference, but it's, it, well, I guess it's because of the Bible. It's a problem because of the people. Yeah. Uh, well, on and on, but it, you know, it takes a little while to realize, okay, this is a situation. It's quite common. It's not like one in a million. And so uh, recognize it and get used to it. And then everybody's comfortable. I hope. Yeah. The I'm thing not sure. to do to start start to not have silence about it to start talking about it because you know, then people realize it, it everyone knew someone you know and cared about them and loved them we just needed to start talking about that it was uh something to just be silent about I thought it was really interesting the what he said about um, how he tried to relate to the pastors that were angry with his with his decision in his, you know that he was supervising. Yes, <coughs> that's a a whole thing unto itself. How do you uh, respond and deal with people who are so angry with you and? We know how um, that issue can become, as some others can, that, uh, well, God is on our side on this, and the Bible says this, and therefore you are a heretic at best. And how can you be a bishop and, and anxious sort of thing? Yeah. I I always kind of found it a, a little be amusing, but 
Oh, uh, as Christians, we use this as our primary authority. And if you check through what Jesus advises, we're good. Um, not a problem. Yeah. If you dig around in the Old Testament, now there's all sorts of stuff there that we do, don't pay any attention to that's absurd. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, it, it well, it's just unfortunate that it comes out that way. It, but why isn't the teachings of Jesus used as the primary decision? not some obscure statement by Paul, <laughs> which may well, have even been good translation. I don't know. Well, and somebody writing in Paul's name, most likely some yeah. of that, but yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure where it was, but he talked about sort of being um, convicted by the fact that people were being hurt by this stance. And that that's not loving then if if we're hurting people by the way we're we're acting then there's something wrong in that i like the line on page 178 in the second paragraph the church truly believed that we all are the children of god and equal before god then we had to learn how to truly own that and live that yeah. I thought that was very pertinent well, and, that everybody's <laughs> equal, but some are more equal than others. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It, if you go down just a little further for, for our, the season that we're in, um, but on our belief that the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross are a sign of the very love of God reaching out to us all, um, that it's a it's a symbol, a symbol of inclusivity and acceptance and grace. And um, along with the other, all the other things that that symbol carries, uh, to see it in that way gives it some um, power, more power and meaning for me at least. What page are you on, Jeff? Oh, uh, sorry, page 178. Okay, thank you. Uh, second, uh, it's the first full paragraph. Mm -hmm. it, well, and, and I guess we can keep going. I was growing, my own beliefs had evolved. Um, another way to say it was I was becoming more and more open to letting the Spirit of God breathe through me and make me new. Therein is the source of real personal change, evolution, and transformation, and it's never ending. And that, um, it's like lifelong learners, it's lifelong uh, spiritually evolving beings, that that's what we're intended to be and not static. And okay, I, I got it. And I'm gonna hold on tight and I'll get out of this world with this stuff and I'll go to heaven. As an older person, I find that line to be very positive, that, that there's still evolution and transformation possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, intended, I think. I think we're not done. Uh, even when we're out of here, we're not done, I think. What do I know? Uh, that's what I think. I was just going to say that's what you challenge us to do every Sunday is to think of things in a new way and to grow. I try and try to do that myself that that we're in this thing together and that we are all um, really called as members of the body to be uh reflecting and and evolving and and well as he said let letting that spirit breathe through that um there's more life to be lived and shared and and 
That's, well, if we don't, okay. if we don't do that, we're going to sink and die because the world around us is changing so rapidly. Yeah. We need to figure out how we are going to grow and be transformed with the new challenges. So, like yes. Gloria said, thank goodness we all can, no matter how we get. Yeah, yeah. And not that we're that old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, well. <laughs> uh. Oh. Um, page 180, uh, we're probably about, ooh, yeah, we're over our time. Um, I don't want to go too long, but um, talking about the, the um, woman who, the anger uh, that was, he was running into um, regarding the GLBTQ um, issue, she said, uh, with her eyes closed sounded just like the anger that was being expressed um, in the fight against Jim Crow segregation. And um, then noticing the quiet, uh, the people in the middle who sort of wait for the anger to, to be spent and people to um, yell themselves out. And that last line Many are simply waiting for the angry to exhaust themselves. They listen patiently, waiting for a deeper wisdom to emerge. And then on the top of the next page, something else happened with some regularity. Quietly, a parent would whisper in my ear, thank you. It would tell me that their son or daughter, niece or nephew was gay. This happened regularly. That's the thing. We have heard that ourselves. Yeah. I like um, the sentence down here on 181. My only challenge was learning how to receive anger and not give it back in return. Yeah. That's something we can all mm. learn from. Yeah, and that kind of goes with uh, um, Eric talking earlier about the distance and Mm -hmm. um, regulating uh, when the anger gets to be too much and I feel it welling up in me I need to step back and and breathe and practice that hard to do The so dance of nonviolent change. Oh, somebody was going to speak. Sorry. No, I was just going to say so it's nine and 10 for next week. Yes. Nine and 10 for next week. Anything else for the good of the cause? Are we ready to? Chris, you still awake there? You look like you're. Uh, okay. <laughs> It's been a long, busy day. <laughs> All right. And it's only Wednesday night, so there's more to come. All right. Well, All right. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday, Gene. Happy birthday, Gene. Happy birthday, Gene. Happy birthday, Gene. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. All right.